So greetings, happy Father's Day, and welcome back inside the Grace Bible Church. Amen? Amen. So it's good having each of you with us this service, and then those will be coming for the 11 a.m. service. So just excited to be back in the Lord's house, but a special recognition to all of our dads that are with us today and present, and for certainly our fathers uh, that may have passed on that knew and loved the Lord, and uh, how thankful we are for them as well. So what we're doing this morning, as far as the service itself, the hymns will be up on the screen behind me. Uh, we've selected the hymns that would be appropriate for the day in which we celebrate, Father's Day. Um, so our first hymn is a, a Christian home, and I'm going to ask before we uh, open in our first hymn if we look to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, we do thank you for this day as we have uh, separated ourselves for a season, for a time here, Father, to come into your house, into your presence, and to worship you, Father, for the fellowship of the like believers, for the joy that it is to be in your house, Father, with these that love you and know you and, and desire to serve you. So, Father, these are, are different times that we find ourselves in, and, and we're not trying to skirt around that. We know this is just a difficult time for some folk, maybe not yet ready to come back just want to watch the services online, and Father, we understand that. And the Lord, we just pray for just a quietness of heart at this time for your servant, Lord, that you may anoint him, give him boldness in your word and in your word for us. So, Father, we just commit all this unto you. And for those laid aside, we do think especially this morning of our sister Katrina. We know it's their desire to be here, and Father, in her time when she recovers, but Brother Joe, even this morning, will be here. So we commit them unto you, and that others were aware of and unaware of, Father, we know the needs of each. We give this day, this hour before you, unto you, for in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So our first hymn is A Christian Home.
all probability for next Sunday have the same two services as well, 9.30 and at 11. And if you are wanting to change to a later service or if someone later wants to come to earlier, please just kind of let um, Jen and Rick know so we have a balance. You know, Lord willing, by next Sunday, maybe a different number, right? <laughs> maybe all one service. We'll just play it by ear. Um, as far as midweek, just a reminder for uh, the prayer meeting on Wednesday night at 7 o'clock. And then as far as the activities that will be moving forward as we get further clearance and understanding, we'll be making those announcements. We are having junior church this morning. Uh, we are set up for that downstairs, and it should be a good time with our uh, young people downstairs. And that will be again next week at the first uh, service. So we appreciate those who, little ones making it out early, making an effort and getting out early as well. Since we will not be taking up tithes, there will be a plate, right? right here. Oh, right and on your way out. Okay. So as you exit this morning, we'll be exiting from the side door. That way, if anyone's arriving early for the, for the second service. It is nice to say that we have a second service, isn't it? <laughs> Um, but you'll be exiting outside. If you have your tithe, you can drop it there in the plate as well. And then, Jen, for next Sunday, we'll have a list for food pantry on the back. So as they come in, if they want to check that as well. Since, since we are not taking up tithes this morning, um, I would like to take what that time would be. We'll be doing this at both services as well uh, for testimonies uh, for our dads. If you're here this, this morning and, and your dad has had an impact in your life, maybe it wasn't your father, maybe it was your father in law, or whoever that may be that was that godly influence uh, to you. Um, a quick word of testimony from anyone. Well, I'll certainly start with uh, had the joy of having breakfast with dad yesterday. So he and mom had said just for these first few weeks, they don't think maybe they should try venturing out, uh, which was fine. But we were able to meet up with them for breakfast yesterday at an outside uh, restaurant and uh, have a time of, of fellowship with them. And just the joy of Dad's consistency in his testimony throughout my life. There was never a time of seeing a waver in his faithfulness to the Lord and his faithfulness in serving the Lord in whatever ministry God called him to. And uh, so I praise the Lord for that influence, not just on, from him, but also for my father-in-law. Uh, Dad was one of the original uh, members and founders of Grace Bible Church, and he was truly a man that you saw a radical change in his life once God got a hold of him. So all those things that were influences of him from the moment he accepted the Lord were all put behind. And God used him in a great and mighty way as well and influenced our lives. Someone else, a word, word of testimony. I just want to say how thankful I am for the men that God put in my life um, that were godly. Um, I don't know if any of you know, but um, I never knew my father. Um, I found out when I was 12, I was able to know that, and I was under my debate. So that was kind of hard at 12, finding that out. Um, through the years, um, God allowed me to be in various Christian homes, 
Amen. It's good having you to the fellowship and let us know this Lord's Day. So next Sunday we are celebrating three weeks late, the 46th anniversary uh, of Grace Bible. So I look forward to that, uh, at both celebrating that at both services. And then also, were there any other prayer requests that have been that were mentioned that we need to acknowledge before we um, uh, maybe pray? Other than my son-in-law, who has been diagnosed with stage three, stage three stomach three. cancer, and he's the husband of the daughter we lost. see you again, <laughs> or at least the upper half of you in a number of cases. I have looked forward to this day for 19 weeks now, and I'm glad that uh, although we have a camera in front of us, I'm not actually preaching to a camera, but real live human beings. You have no idea how much I look forward to this, to preach to people who can respond, who can even talk back to me. So it's great to have you with us today. This is 
a day that we celebrate fathers and grandfathers and great-grandfathers. The greatest gift I ever had came from God. I call him Dad. I don't know where I got that from. I don't like it really. I guess if you're not a child of God, that may very well be true. But if you're a child of God, of course, there is no question that the greatest gift we ever had from God was our salvation through Jesus Christ. But that God's uh, gifts are many, and he does give us dads, both those that are saved and those that are not saved. He gives us all parents to raise us, to teach us, to help us through life, and we are grateful to him for that. But not the greatest gift. Happy Father's Day to all of you that are dads and grandfathers and great-grandfathers. Uh, what are you leaving behind? That's really the message this morning. What are you leaving behind? So, we have door number one, door number two, and door number three. And what inheritance are you going to leave to your children? That's what I want us to focus on. Dads, what inheritance? Are you leaving to your children? Some good news I have for you if you don't have a will, don't worry. The state has one for you. I, I hope you all have a will. Um, and if you don't, you might want to make one because you may not like the one the state has for you, but I assure you the state will take care of your inheritance if you don't do it. So if you haven't done it yet, by all means, take care of that. Door number one, some of us uh, may leave money as an inheritance. That's frequently done. We have uh, one young lady that had an inheritance from a dear man that uh, took care of her as a dad. And uh, maybe he left her a house in the country. It's rather small, but we should be grateful for whatever our parents leave, right? Or maybe you are leaving land. That looks like Lancaster area. 100 acres in Lancaster County. That'd be nice as an inheritance. Bumper sticker on the back of a motor home. Maybe you've seen this one. I've seen it more than once. We're spending our children's inheritance. Kids, maybe you're going to get nothing. <laughs> Especially if your parents have a big travel, one of those big travel trailers. I uh, thought about that bumper sticker and I said to my wife, because I often teased her, I do that pretty much every day, whether she likes it or not. And uh, she's not really interested in necessarily retiring and getting into a travel trailer and traveling the country. I thought it would be a neat thing to do, but uh, it's not her cup of tea, which is fine. In any case, we were going down the Turnpike, New Jersey Turnpike, actually going up it, and I saw this travel trailer, that shiny, beautiful, large, and uh, I thought about that bumper sticker, and I said to my wife, let's buy one of those travel trailers, just, just kind of to get her goat, which I do sometimes. You guys do too, I think. And she said to me, Steve, that was a horse trailer. <laughs> so I didn't run out and buy one of those. But I do want to share with you really this morning, in all seriousness, two biblical principles for leaving an inheritance to your children. Hopefully you have a, well, I don't know, we don't have a bulletin. You can't write on the back of the church hymnal because we took those out. Um, but if you have anything to write on, you might want to jot these down. Just two items, two uh, principles for leaving an inheritance to your children. But first, I need to share with you two case studies to kind of uh, lay the groundwork to help you understand. So the first case study is the case of Joseph. And you're familiar with him, I'm sure. And if you brought your Bible, out too, right, so that nobody would get any chance of any kind of germ. Uh, but if you brought your Bible, and I hope you did, turn
turn to Genesis chapter 37 as we begin our case study of Joseph. And you notice that his father, Jacob, dwelt in the land where his father, Isaac, was a stranger, and it was the land of Canaan. And uh, these are the generations of Jacob. Joseph being how old? Verse 2. How old? You go ahead and call it out. That's why I'm waiting for wait first. Yeah. Yeah. 17. See, I can't do that with camera. Camera doesn't answer me back. He's 17 years. He's a teenager. Just 17 years old. And I'm sure you're already familiar with the story. It's a, it's a famous one. There were a number of brothers that he had, and his brethren saw that his father loved him more than the rest of them. And as you know, because he loved him more than the others, he made him this fancy coat. Uh, sometimes it's called a coat of many colors. It's, it's really a long-sleeved coat such as royalty would wear. Um, in other words, he stood out. He looked like somebody important. He stood out compared with them. And uh, I'm assuming you can already put a biblical principle together. It's not one of the two that I'm sharing with you, but I hope you do not make the mistake of showing favoritism toward any one of your children. Or grandchildren, for that matter. Uh, because it hurts. And it hurt his brothers, and they did not like it. In fact, they hated him. Because... He was the favorite one. And uh, they couldn't even, end of verse 4, they could not even say shalom to him. They couldn't even speak peaceably to him. And Joseph, verse 5, dreamed the dream, told it to his brethren, and they hated him how much? Even, even more. Now, I think Joseph is a pretty smart kid. I think he could add up two and two and get four, and I think, it's just my personal opinion now, but, but I think when you look at the dream, that it didn't take too much common sense to recognize that uh, the dream showed him as being number one of all the kids. Uh, he dreamed this dream, and he said to his brothers, uh, verse 7, We were binding sheaves in the field, and, and my sheaf arose and stood upright. And behold, your sheaves stood round about, and they, you, your sheaves bowed down to my sheaf. Well, I don't know about you, but if I had dreamed that dream, I'd have kept it to myself. <laughs> his brethren said to him, Shalt thou indeed reign over us? They had no problem interpreting the dream. Or shalt thou indeed have dominion over us? And they hated him even more. And he dreamed another dream. And he didn't have the sense here to the first dream to be quiet about the second one. So he shared this second dream. He said, I dreamed another dream and the, and the sun and the moon and 11 stars made obeisance to me. Sun, moon, 11 stars. How many brothers did he have? He had 11 brothers. He also had a father and a mother. Sun and moon, my, your parents and your 11 brothers, they're all going to bow down to you? Uh, that's a lot of shutzpah, as they say, I guess, in Hebrew. And he told it to his father and his brethren, and his father rebuked him. And said to him, what is this dream that you have dreamed? Shall I and your mother and your brothers indeed bow ourselves down to you? What are you talking about? And his brother had envied him. But his father observed. His father thought about the saying. Introduction. Genesis 37. That's what starts it all. And again, this is a very famous story. You know it well. 
his brothers are shepherds, and uh, the time comes that um, his brothers don't come back too soon, and so he is, he is sent uh, to find his brothers wherever they happen to be taking care of the sheep. And we come to the fact that Joseph has a testimony. Chapter 39, please skip over just a couple chapters. Joseph, as you know, was uh, found by his brothers, or I should say, they, he found them. And when they saw him coming, they said, uh, this, is, this is our chance. Let's kill him. And uh, one of his brothers, Reuben, being the firstborn and therefore responsible for whatever goes on, Reuben says, uh, no, that's not profitable. Let's just uh, throw him into this pit and, uh, and, and we'll... Uh, uh, we'll make something out of him. Maybe we can get some money, you know. Maybe we can sell him off as a, a servant. Uh, there were some Ishmaelites that were going to be heading down that way. Because Reuben really wanted to rescue him and take him home. And when Reuben's not there, the brothers uh, see these Ishmaelites coming and they go and they sell him as a slave to the Ishmaelites who are going to take him down to Egypt. And that's where you find him in 39, chapter 39, 1 to 6. Joseph was brought down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, captain of the guard, which sounds kind of nice, uh, but what that really means is captain of the executioners. Uh, in ancient times, uh, kingdoms didn't do what we do here in the United States. Um, you didn't get 32 chances to appeal your case. Um, you may not even get one chance. If the king didn't like you, it was off with your head, or they impale you, or they destroy you in some other way. And, and so uh, you have a captain of the executioners. Actually, the word can also translate to cook. Cook, executioner. What's, what's the relationship? A cook kills the meat and then cooks it. That's what the executioner was doing. He was killing. And this person was the captain of them. As such, he had the prison in his house. And so the captain of the executioners, and believe me, if I was a slave, I wouldn't want to be sold to the captain of the executioners. But that's Joseph's plot in life. And so he is bought. And we find in verse 2, Jehovah, the Lord, all capitals, Jehovah was with Joseph. And he was a prosperous man, and he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian, and his master saw that the Lord was with him. Saw that the Lord was with him. Noticed the difference that Joseph God, Joseph's God makes in his life. And that the Lord made all that he did prosper in his hand. And Joseph found grace in his sight, and he served him, that is, served Potiphar, and he made him overseer over his house and over all that he put that he had put into his hand. And it came to pass from the time that he had made him overseer in his house and over all that he had, that the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. And the blessing of the Lord was upon all that he had in his house and in the field. And he left all that he had in Joseph's hand, and he knew not what he had. He didn't even know how much he had. He totally trusted Joseph, didn't even realize how large his bank account was, how many stocks he had, how many animals he had, how much crops he had. God was just blessing and blessing, and, and he was just grateful that Joseph was there. And Joseph was a goodly person and well-favored. Joseph has a testimony, a testimony that he serves the living God. He let it be known to Potiphar, and no doubt to all others that were around. And God blessed him. Joseph knows theology. Chapter 39, verses 7 to 12. Take a look. Came to pass after <clears throat> these things that his master's wife cast her eyes upon Joseph, and she said, Lie with me. But he refused, and said unto his master's wife, Behold, my master wanteth not what, or in other words, doesn't know. My master doesn't know what's with me. He's put everything 
in the house and under my control, and he's committed all that he has to my hand, and there is none greater in this house than I. Neither has he kept anything back except you, because you're his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against my master? Oh, wait a second. It doesn't say that. What does it say? And sin against God. You see, Joseph somehow knows this is not a sin against Potiphar if, if I would be immortal. It's, and it's not a sin against Potiphar's wife if I would be immortal. It's, it's a sin against God. Joseph understands all sin is against God. It may involve other people as well, as you know. You can just sin against God, or you can sin against God and your brother. But ultimately, all sin against God, because God's the one who sets up the rules for his creation. And so, it came to pass, verse 10, as she spake to Joseph day by day, that he hearkened not unto her to lie by her, or to be with her. I don't even want to be around you. It came to pass about this time that Joseph went into the house to do his business, and there was none of the men of the house there within. And she caught him by his garment, saying, Lie with me. And he left his garment in her hand and fled, and he got out. Bottom line, Joseph knows theology. Number three, very important. Joseph doesn't touch God's glory. You know that, uh, again, because you know the story, his wife yells out that Joseph has tried to abuse me. And his master puts him in prison in the house of Potiphar. You also know, I'm sure, that uh, Joseph is blessed while he's in prison. And uh, you may not know that Potiphar perhaps did not believe his wife's cry because Egyptian law indicated that if you uh, were being immoral with somebody else's wife, you could be the recipient of a thousand blows or put to death. Didn't happen with Joseph. No doubt because of his testimony. Chapter 40, verses 1 through 8 it came to pass after these things, you know all about the butler and the baker, I'm sure. The king of Egypt, Pharaoh, puts the butler and the baker in prison. <clears throat> Pharaoh was angry with these two officers. He put them in ward, verse 3, or in the prison, in the house of the captain of the guard. And Joseph is there, bound. And the captain of the guard charged Joseph with them, and he served them, and they continued a season in ward. The captain of the guard says, Joseph, you take care of these guys. And they dreamed a dream, both of them. And I believe that you are familiar with the dream. Each man had a dream, and they have similarities to them, and the butler uh, is concerned about his dream, and Joseph comes to them in the morning, verse 6. He said, why are you so sad? And he asked Pharaoh's officers that were with him in the ward in prison, uh, why do you look so sad today? End of verse 7. They said to him, we have dreamed a dream, and there is no interpreter of it. And Joseph said unto them, do not interpretations belong to who? To God. Uh, you notice he didn't say, oh, I, I can interpret your dream. He doesn't touch God's glory. He gives God all the credit. Interpretations of dreams belong to God. Tell them to me, I pray you. And the chief butler told his dream to Joseph, and he said to him, in my dream, behold, a vine was before me, and in the vine were three branches, and it was as though it budded and her blossoms shot forth and the clusters thereof brought forth ripe grapes and Pharaoh's cup was in my hand and I took the grapes and pressed them into Pharaoh's cup and I gave the cup into Pharaoh's hand and Joseph said, this is the interpretation of it. The three branches are three days. 
days. In three days, you are going to be lifted up and restored to your position serving Pharaoh. Well, that's great news. All that better than being executed, which is entirely possible if you don't please the Pharaoh. No doubt, no doubt thinking that, though, that's a pretty good interpretation. I, I want to tell you my dream. And then the baker told him his dream, and you know the result of that too, I'm sure. It ended up uh, very different than with the butler. And he was going to lose his head in a different way. It'll be lifted up by being cut off. And uh, he was going to be impaled on a stake, and the birds are going to come eat his flesh, and that's going to be the end of you. But they restored the chief butler to his butlership, and he gave the cup to Pharaoh's hand in verse 21, and uh, the chief baker is hanged. And, oh, sad, verse 23, uh, the chief butler, uh, he didn't remember Joseph. He forgot him. Joseph had said that, now when you get back to your position, I'm an innocent man, would you, you know, put in a good word to Pharaoh for me? And, uh, yeah, yeah, I, I just forgot all that. How could you possibly forget what this man has done for you, how he's interpreted your vision? How would you forget that? But it's a God thing, isn't it? We need to remember as we read the word of God, we are reminded again and again and again and again God's in control of every aspect of life. And so he forgets. And it came to pass, chapter 41, at the end of two full years, that Pharaoh dreamed a dream. Two years later. What does that mean? That means Joseph is in prison for two more years. Why? The answer, no doubt, is because God's still teaching him. God has things to teach. He's going to use him, but he needs to teach him things first. So, two years later, Pharaoh dreams a dream. And you're familiar with it, I believe. Here is a, a river, and out of the river, no doubt reference to the Nile, come seven well-favored, fattened-up cows. And then after them come out seven skinny, just skin and bones cows. And they ate up the fat cows. And uh, Pharaoh's troubled by that. And he dreamed another dream, verse 5. Seven ears of corn, that's the old King James, uh, seven uh, heads of grain is what it refers to, not ears of corn as in the corn stalk, but, but heads of grain. Seven heads of grain came up on one stalk. Now, I'm not a farmer, but I don't think you normally get seven grains. Do you get seven grains? I don't think you get seven grains, uh, seven the heads of grain on one stalk. But the, this time, that's what it looked like. And, and then there were seven other skinny, blasted, lousy looking heads of grain that came up and they ate up the first seven and that troubled Pharaoh and and that's the time when the butler says now I remember I know somebody that can interpret your dream because he interpreted my dream and the dream of the baker you remember the baker don't you Pharaoh yeah well he interpreted his dream as well and so Pharaoh calls for Joseph, and he gets all cleaned up, and he stands before Pharaoh. And that's in verse 14. And verse 15, Pharaoh said that Joseph, I dreamed the dream, and there is none that can interpret it. And I have heard say of thee that you can understand a dream to interpret it. And Joseph answered Pharaoh, saying, yes, I can do it. Just tell me what it is. Right? You're following along in your Bibles, aren't you? Verse 16. I can do it. That's, just tell me. Isn't that what he says? Yes? No? No? No. Oh, he says it's not in me. I can't do that. God 
shall give Pharaoh an answer of peace. I can't do that, but I know a person who can. Elohim, my God, can do that for you. He doesn't touch God's glory. Where did Joseph get his theological education? He obviously had a fair amount of knowledge of the Word of God, or God's ways, God's plans, who God is. Where did he get his theological education? Now, you know that I'm kind of a teacher at heart, so um, this is a multiple choice question. You want to wait until you get all the answers up there and, and then pick the best one. Okay, so was it the Grace Bible Church of Canaan? Because he grew up in Canaan, of course, you know. Or was it Mr. and Mrs. Potiphar? Or maybe it was the Egyptian Christian school. I, I like that because I'm in favor of Christian schools, especially good Christian schools. And then there's a fourth answer, the Old Testament. So, as I've often said to students, you, you look at your choices and you quickly rule out whatever is obviously not right. So that narrows down your choices. If you have to guess, better to guess out of three than out of four. So we can take, I think, Mr. and Mrs. Potiphar out of this. I don't think they thought anything about uh, his God. So what do you think about the A, C, and D? Vote for A? No. Vote for C? No? Okay. How about D? D looks good. If I was going to, if this is my multiple choice, I'd be choosing, I'd be choosing D. Except... If you had me as a teacher, you would also know I always put an E down there. None of these. Uh, now, would anybody vote for E? Oh, think now. Think. Think harder. Who's going to vote for E? Ah, uh, yes. And why? Because there is no Old Testament at the time of Joseph. There was no Old Testament until the time of Moses. That was a long ways into the future yet. The Bible wasn't written yet. So, so, where in the world would he get this theology from? Well, hold that thought. And let me give you one more lesson from Joseph, which is extremely important for us today, and always really. Genesis chapter 50. And uh, once again, I picked a story, a familiar event that you are well aware of. You know the story about how his brothers came down and he played some, uh, some little tricks uh, on them. They didn't recognize him and it goes back and forth and eventually he reveals himself to his brothers because he is the chief one in command apart from Pharaoh and he's in charge of all the food stores and, and uh, now he's, he's kind to his brothers and his father comes down, and they're living there in the, in the land of Goshen, and, and eventually his father dies, and now his brothers are afraid. They're afraid that now that his father has died, he's going to execute them. And so we have come to uh, chapter 50 of Genesis, verse 15. And when Joseph's brethren saw that their father was dead, they said, Joseph will peradventure hate us and will certainly requite us all, get us back, get revenge for the evil we did to him. And they sent a messenger unto Joseph saying, your father commanded us uh, before he died, uh, he, he wants us to tell you uh, that you should be good to us. No doubt they're quite afraid. And they admit their sin. And verse 18, his brethren also went and fell down before his face, and they said, Behold, we are their servants. And Joseph said unto them, Fear not, for am I in the place of God? Fear not, am I in the place of God? But as for you, you thought evil against me, but God meant it unto me for good. To bring to pass as it is this day to save much people alive. Now therefore, he says, don't be afraid. What you meant for evil, God meant for good. We're the two.
two lessons. Number one, revenge belongs to God. Could Joseph have gotten revenge? Oh, absolutely, no problem there. Would they deserve it if, uh, if he gave it? Yes, they, they would deserve it. They were out to kill him. Um, but he doesn't get revenge. Revenge belongs to God. We should all teach our children that. We should not really be teaching our children and our grandchildren, hey, if that bully, uh, you know, pushes you around, sock him a good one. Now let him know you're not going to take it. We really shouldn't do that. Uh, we shouldn't uh, think that it's okay for us to do evil to someone if someone does evil to us first. That makes us no different than the person who did evil in the first place. Revenge belongs to God. And second, and this maybe has happened to you, it's happened to me, it often happens to believers. I shouldn't say it happens every day in any sense, but it does happen to believers. Others may act toward us with evil motives. That may happen on your work, in your workplace. But God is in control. And Romans 8.28 is still in the book. And everything, and that's everything without exception, everything works out together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose, to those who are his children. Everything works out together for our good. We may not see it immediately, but often we see it later on. And we may never see it until we get to heaven, I don't know. But if you're a child of God, you probably have experienced sometime in life, maybe more than once, the things that you thought were bad, God turned them around and worked it for good. Two lessons from Joseph. Well, where did he get his theology from? Where do you suppose he learned these lessons? If it wasn't in the Christian school in Egypt, and it sure wasn't Potiphar. And it wasn't the Old Testament. How, how could this 17-year-old learn so much? Any ideas? His father, his parents, no doubt. But especially his father. His father taught him. And that's what the Bible says we're supposed to do for our children and our grandchildren. Teach them God's ways. Daniel is case study number two, which we need to rush into quickly. Approximately 1,200 years later, we come to Daniel chapter 1. So turn your Bibles there, please. In Daniel chapter 1, you have those uh, famous few verses which tell us that Daniel was taken into captivity to the king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar was his name. And uh, Nebuchadnezzar comes and he, he captures Judah. And he's taking uh, children, probably early teens, verse 4, children who was no blemish, they're physically fit, they're well favored, they're skillful in wisdom. These are children that uh, have a lot of promise. No doubt they're given some IQ tests and found out, well, we take the top 10% here and, and uh, we teach them our language, our customs, and after we have uh, fattened them up and gotten them physically fit and even better than they are now, we will give them the very best food and uh, teach them our ways, and then they can serve us. And that's chapter 1, verses 1 to 7. And you'll notice that the Names of these three are Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, verse 6. In verse 7, they change their names to Belteshazzar, and Hananiah's name is changed to Shadrach, Mishael to Meshach, and, and uh, Azariah to Abednego. And we will study the meaning of those names later on, uh, because that's my purpose to, to share with you an exegetical study of the book of Daniel in days to come. Their conviction... Chapter 1, verse 8. These boys had conviction. Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with a portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore, he requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Uh, sir, 
uh, would you mind if we not eat the king's food? And again, you know the story. The king, uh, the, uh, the master of the eunuchs, uh, wanted to be kind to uh, Daniel, but said, I'm afraid I'd lose my head. And so Daniel says to the next person down, who's directly responsible for him, would you just give us a, a short test? And he does, and Daniel and his friends are found to be much stronger, much healthier, much wiser than everybody else that ate the king's food. He purposed in his heart. They made a commitment to serve God. That's one of the reasons why I believe in Christian camping, because it gives an opportunity for young people to get away, away from all kinds of stuff that take their attention, to allow God some time to get their attention and maybe work in their hearts and maybe bring them to the place where they will make some decisions, make some commitments. Their confession, chapter 2, verses 24 to 28. In the meantime, you know, uh, Nebuchadnezzar has set up this <coughs> image. And um, uh, let's see. No, that's a little bit later. The image is coming later. Uh, we have Nebuchadnezzar having a vision. And nobody can interpret the vision. Well, actually, they said they could. But the king said, no, I don't want you to just interpret my vision. I want you to tell me what the vision is. And then interpret it for me. And they say, nobody can do that. And he said, if you don't do that, I'm going to kill you all. And, and so the word gets out to kill all the wise guys. And Daniel and his friends are part of that group. So Daniel says, verse 24, to Arioch, whom the king had ordained to destroy the wise men of Babylon. And he went and said unto, unto him, Don't destroy the wise men. Uh, bring me before the king, and I will show the king the interpretation. Now he doesn't know the interpretation yet. He doesn't even know the vision yet. Uh, he doesn't know what's going on, but he knows his God. And so he goes before the king, Arioch brings him in, and the king answered and said unto Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, verse 26, Are you able to make known unto me the dream which I have seen, and the interpretation thereof? Daniel answered in the presence of the king and said, The secret which the king has demanded cannot the wise men and astrologers, the magicians, the soothsayers, they can't show that to the king. They don't know. But there is a God. There is a God in heaven, and this is Nebuchadnezzar's first introduction to the God of heaven. There is a God in heaven that reveals secrets and makes known unto the king Nebuchadnezzar what shall be in the latter days. Thy dream and the visions of thy head upon thy bed are these, and he gives him what he dreamed, and he interprets it for him. But Daniel confesses, this is not me. This is God that can do this for you. Daniel has a commitment, and so do his friends. Chapter 3, Nebuchadnezzar has now set up an image, and once again, you're familiar with it, and when the band plays, you all bow down and worship. And if you don't worship, I throw you into the fiery furnace. Simple as that. And you know that they did not bow down. They did not worship when the band played. And so you come to verse 12. These... Jews are accused by the Chaldeans. There are certain Jews, they say, to the king, to Nebuchadnezzar, whom you have set over the affairs of the province of Avalon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, have not regarded thee. They don't serve your gods. They don't worship the golden image which you've set up. So Nebuchadnezzar, in his rage and fury, commands them to be brought before them and says to them, listen, guys, when the band plays, you better bow down. I'll give you another chance. You know, you're nice guys, I'll give you another chance, but uh, when the band plays, you better worship or you're fried. And verse 15, if you're ready and you hear the band, you worship. But if you don't, end of verse 15, who is that God that shall deliver you out of my hands? Oh, oh, that's, that's dangerous talk. 
challenged God. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said unto the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. Or in other words, we, we don't need to have deliberation. We don't need to consider this. We, we don't need to pray about it. Uh, if it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace. And he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. And uh, if not, be it known unto you, O king, that we will still not serve your gods, nor worship the golden image which you have set up. They had commitment. No matter what it cost us, we're going to serve our God. No matter where it takes us in life, no matter what country we go to, no matter what person we must speak to, no matter what work we must do, we will serve our God, whatever it takes, even though it means our death. How do you think these young men develop such character? Got any ideas? These are just teenagers when they're first taken. But remember their names, Daniel, Mishael, Azariah, Hananiah. They're all names associated with God. Their parents gave them those names. Their parents are godly parents. Their dads, no doubt, have taught them the word of God. And yes, there was an Old Testament by that time. <coughs> Two inheritance principles. And I need to move quickly. Principle number one. What you leave in your children is far more important than the material things you leave to them. And if you have pen or a pencil or want to write it down, I encourage you to write down these two principles. What you leave in your children, what you leave in your grandchildren, or in your great-grandchildren, is far more important than anything you leave to them. And I need to uh, give you some information before we go to principle number two. I decided to write my last will and testament. And so I, I share this with you before we go to number two. All right, Pastor Steve, being occasionally of sound mind, do hereby leave the following. To my son Jeremy, I give Ron Holton's Ford Ranger. <laughs> now, wait a minute, it gets better. To my daughter, Christy, the farmer's wife, I leave Rick and Jen's chickens. <laughs> to Jack, my musically talented grandson, oh, I, wish he had, I wish I had some of his musical talent, he's going to get his license next month, so I leave Jim Miller's violin and red truck. <clears throat> and to grandsons, Luke and Jake, I leave Don Stimson's Christmas tree farm. important to leave is what you have experienced yourself. What you leave in them is more important than anything you leave to them, but you have to own it. It needs to be your character. You can only leave what you own. My father didn't tell me how to live. He lived and let me watch him do it. I thought on that for a little bit, and I thought, well, that, that sounds good. He was a good example. But once again, I have problems with it. I have problems with the first part. And here's the reason. If you don't tell them how to live, don't worry. Because our culture will do it for you. Now you can worry. You can worry if you let culture teach your children and your grandchildren how to live. So, what's the alternative? The alternative is we need to all follow Ezra's example. 
Ezra's example found in Ezra 7, verse 10, and with this we close. And you can open up to Ezra 7, 10 if you would like. I will put it on the screen. Ezra said, listen, I first of all prepare my heart. And as you meet each day with God, and I certainly hope you do, first you need to prepare your heart. You need to focus. You need to be in a quiet place. You need to be someplace where the Lord can speak to you. He prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord. With all your heart, seek the Lord. He will be found. He will speak to you. He will teach you. He will guide you. He will strengthen you. He will prepare you for whatever you need to face in life. He will help you to teach your children and grandchildren. And to do it. Ezra didn't just learn the word, oh, hey, hey, son, I'm here, here, this is what the Lord just told No, he first listened to what the Lord said, and then he did it himself. So he was an example, yes, but more than that, then he would teach the, in, the ordinances and the statutes to Israel. So first, first you prepare your heart. Second, seek the Lord. Third, do it, and then teach it. Let's pray. Father, take your word, I, I ask, and help us to remember, help us to apply it. Help us to live in such a way that Jesus is seen in us. In his name we pray. Amen. Search me, O God, know my heart today, cry me, O Savior, and know my thoughts, I pray. Let's stand together as we sing this closing hymn.